Um, I'm, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Andrew Polstra. He's coming to us from Blockstream, where he's the director of research. And he's going to be talking about Taproot, which is, I think, on everybody's mind these days. So without further ado, let's put this in full screen. And if you want to click. Thank you, guys. Thank you so, so much for coming. This is going to be an awesome weekend. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, waking up so early for the first day of the conference and making the trek from the registration room over here. It's great to it's more, more faces than I expected, considering. Um, and hello to all the live stream people uh, hiding from the coronavirus. I hope it doesn't reach you. Best of luck. <laughs> so I told myself I was going to write my slides on the plane. As you can maybe tell, I instead spent the entire plane ride drawing this title slide. Which I'm very proud of. I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so there, thank you. So I'm going to split this talk into two halves. Um, I've only got you know, 20 or 30 minutes. I can't really describe Taproot in full detail in half an hour, or probably even in a couple of hours. So instead, what I'm going to do is give um, a brief overview of what Taproot is, describe some of the technical um, reasons for it being what it is, and just really give kind of a high-level summary of the components of it. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit more generally about how we design proposals for Bitcoin, the kind of considerations that we have to make for a system with such high uptime requirements with so many diverse stakeholders who all more or less have a veto over proposals, but nobody has the ability to push things through, and where everything is very conservative. We're all very afraid of deploying broken crypto or somehow breaking the system or causing a consensus failure or, or who knows what. Um, so, so let's get into it. So first half, what, what is Taproot? What, what is uh, Taproot? So Taproot is a proposal for Bitcoin that was developed by originally by Peter Wolla and Greg Maxwell and myself. Uh, it's later been taken up by, by a small, probably 10, 10 major contributors who have been doing various things on IRC and on the mailing list over the last year or two. Um, it's a new transaction output version, meaning that it's a new way to define spending conditions for your coin on Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what that means. So first off, for those who don't know, Bitcoin has what's called the scripting system. Um, it has the ability to specify spending conditions on all of the coins. Typically for casual users, the way we think of Bitcoin is you have an address, right? The address represents some sort of public key. Um, you have a secret key corresponding to the public key, and if you can produce a signature with that secret key, you can spend the coins. This is actually just a special case of what Bitcoin can do, right? It's not just one key, one signature kind of thing. We have the ability to describe arbitrary spending conditions, where arbitrary means specifically you can check signatures with various public keys, like you do with a normal one key uh, standard wallet thing. Uh, you can check hash locks, which means you can put a hash of some data on the blockchain and it will enforce that somebody reveals the pre-image of that, which is a way to do like a, a forced publication of some shared secret, say. Uh, it can do time locks, where it won't allow coins to move until some amount of time has gone by. And you can do arbitrary conditions of these, arbitrary monotone functions. So that means you create a, a circuit out of ands and ors and like thresholds like two of three or five of ten or whatever of these different checks. And you can do arbitrary sets of these. And the mechanism for this is, is called Bitcoin script. A script can do uh, a fair number of other things, most of which are not super exciting. Um, and it can't do a whole bunch of things. In particular, it's, uh, you can't use Bitcoin script to enforce things like velocity limits. Uh, a common thing people want to do is have a wallet where they have some coins and say like only a certain number of coins are allowed to move in a given day. That kind of thing is you can't do with Bitcoin script. So for people thinking about future research directions for Bitcoin, this is the kind of missing functionality that we have. Um, although as we'll see by the end of this talk, it's not so straightforward. It's just having a cool idea and, and everybody cheering on, cheering for you. Um, okay, so that's Bitcoin script. Um, an interesting thing about script, um, we use this word script, which sort of conjures up uh, uh, connotations of scripting languages like, like Shell or, or Python or PHP or, or Node or whatever people use these days. Um, a d difference between Bitcoin script 
and an ordinary scripting language, is that in Bitcoin script, you're sort of describing conditions under which a spend is valid. So you aren't executing a bunch of code. Yeah, I mean, you literally are executing a bunch of code, but morally what you're doing is just demonstrating that some conditions exist that were sufficient to spend the coins and you have met those conditions, okay? So scripts often specify a wide set of conditions. Let's say you have like a, a two of three uh, signature check, then there are three different public keys. Any of the, the three pairs of those could be used to spend them. You may ultimately have, say, a time lock with an emergency key. Maybe after a certain amount of time has gone by, maybe the original three keys have been lost or, or something. And then there's an alternate key. You can do this, but what hits the blockchain when you're spending coins is only one condition, right? Only one of these. So you have the script that's describing a whole bunch of different things and ultimately only one of them matters. Um, only one of them matters once the coins are spent. If they don't get spent, none of them matter, right? So it would be nice from a privacy slash scalability perspective um, so it's super nice that I can, I can bundle those up, by the way. There's usually a trade-off there, but in, in, for the purpose of this talk, privacy and scalability are gonna come hand in hand. Um, it would be ideal if we weren't even revealing all these spending conditions, right? If at most one of them matters, why are we publishing them all? Why are we making everybody download them? Why are we making everybody parse these? Why are we making everybody uh, check that they make sense and that they hash to the correct thing and blah, 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 blah. So around 2011, 2012 on Bitcoin Talk, I believe, which is where all, all ideas in Bitcoin were invented in 2011 on Bitcoin Talk, by the way. So you can, you can just Google for them and then resurrect them. That's easy publication. Um, there was this idea called MASC, or Merkleized Abstracts Index Tree, um, which now I think is Merkleized like alternate script something or other. It's, the, it's not quite an AST. Um, the idea is that you take all these different spending conditions. You put them in what's called a Merkle tree, which means you take all the conditions, you hash them up, you take all the hashes, you bundle those together and hash them up. And you get this cryptographic object that lets you cheaply reveal any one of the conditions um, or any subset of the conditions without needing to reveal all of them. Um, and this is smaller. This, uh, what actually hits the chain is just a single 32 byte hash representing all the different conditions. And when you use one of the conditions, you have to reveal that condition and then also a couple more hashes that give a uh, cryptographic proof that the original hash committed to it, okay? Um, so this idea has been floating around for quite a while. It's never actually been implemented. Why hasn't it? Uh, for a couple reasons that I'm, I'm going to go into in more detail, but one is that for something like Mask, there is a wide range of design surface, and because changes in Bitcoin are so far-reaching and so, so, um, so difficult to do, Nobody wants to propose something for Bitcoin and nobody wants to accept a proposal for Bitcoin that isn't the best possible proposal that does what we're trying to do. And so for years, we've had variations on different ways to do math, different ways to hide script components, questions about should we improve the script system at the same time as we're doing this? Should we change the output type and so on and so forth? Uh, since 2012, we've had a number of different upgrade mechanisms up here. We've learned a lot more about um, the difference between hard forks and soft forks and when hard forks are necessary and what they're appropriate for. We've learned new ways to soft fork in changes, especially changes to the script system in ways that minimize disruption to nodes that haven't yet updated. Um, so on, all, on all, all levels of this kind of change, we've made a lot of progress over the last several years. Um, and so, in one sense, it's been worthwhile. Like, it's great that we didn't try to deploy this in 2012, because what we did would have sucked. Um, on the other hand, it's 2020 and we still don't have it, right? So, so there's this trade-off that I'm, I'm gonna talk about a, a bit more. Um, but anyway, that's, that's one of the two major ideas in Taproot, is this thing masked. You put all your spending conditions in a Merkle tree, you only have to reveal one. Nobody can see how many they are, nobody can see what the other ones are. Um, everything's great. The second part of Taproot is this sort of family of things I'm going to call key tricks, okay? So the standard Bitcoin script address, whatever you want to, uh, to describe it as, has just a single key, right? And then you spend the coins by providing a single signature. Traditionally, a public key belongs to one entity. It sort of identifies that entity um, and it, it identifies the person who holds the private key as the person who is able to spend these coins. And so the idea is there's just one person with this, with this private key. 
one person has complete and sole custody of the coin. Turns out there's a lot more you can do with keys. Um, with single keys is a cool part. So, and a lot of this stuff is made much easier using Schnorr signatures versus ECGSA. That's something, those, those are um, some terms that have, have shown up in the media around Taproot a whole lot. I'm not gonna go into that, but I'm just gonna throw that out there that these are two different digital signature algorithms. They both use the same kind of keys. The Schnorr signatures let you do some cool things with the keys in a much simpler way. Um, so the most important one, which I've highlighted here, is multi-signatures. If you have several participants who all individually have a signing key, it's possible for them to combine all of their keys into one. Um, what they do is they all choose uh, some, some randomizers. They all multiply their key by some randomizers, and this is a technical thing that, allow, that prevents them from, uh, <coughs> from creating malicious keys that cancel out other participants. Then they add them together, where I'm using add in the sense of elliptic curves, which is not really very much like any addition most people are familiar with, uh, but it behaves algebraically exactly like addition, so we call it addition. You add these keys together, you get a single key out of this. And then what's cool is, all those participants, by cooperating, are then able to produce a single signature for the single key and publish that to the blockchain. So what the blockchain is going to see is just one key, one signature. Same as if there was only one participant, same as if it was an ordinary wallet that, that is not doing anything remarkable. Uh, but in fact, behind the scenes, there are multiple parties who all share custody of these coins and who all had to cooperate to move the coins. So that's kind of a cool thing. You can do variants of this. You can do what are called threshold signatures, where now instead of having, say, like five participants who all combine their keys and then the five of them can cooperate, you can have five participants combine their keys in such a way that any three of them might cooperate. And so there are, I guess, uh, five choose three different possibilities here, and any of those five choose three possibilities um, of sets of signers are able to spend the coins. And this requires a little bit of a more complicated interaction protocol between the individual participants. But again, what the blockchain sees is just one key, one signature. And in fact, you can do more interesting things than thresholds. Again, you can do arbitrary monotone functions. Arbitrary different sets of signers can be all bundled together into one key, which is pretty cool. Another thing you can do with keys and signatures that we've learned is something called adapter signatures where if you have two parties doing a two of two multi-signature, so they both have to cooperate to spend the coins, they can actually modify the multi-signing protocol such that when the second party finishes the protocol, when they complete the signature, by doing so, they actually reveal a decryption key for some secret to the other party. And so a lot of what we use hash premages and hash locks for in Bitcoin is when you have two parties and, and you want one to have to reveal a secret to the other as a condition of taking their coins. So we can actually bundle that into the signatures. I'm not gonna go into that, but the, uh, the keyword to look up would be probably be adapter signatures or scriptless scripts. Uh, adapter signatures are the specific construction I'm describing. Um, another neat thing you can do with just keys and signatures, in fact, this one's just with keys, and this is the only uh, equation that I'm going to have in all of these slides. Last year I did, I did like 100 equations in a row uh, in half an hour of the first talk of the, the expo and I got a lot of, I, I was told that I scared people, which that's, I mean, that's an accomplishment, right? You want people to feel, right? that's, that's what we do. That's why we're up here. Um, I only have one now, and this is a quick um, commitment equation. So what's going on here? So on the left-hand side, I've got some sort of key that I'm going to call P, P for public key, not for private. Um, I'm going to modify my public key here. I'm going to add, what's this? This is the hash of the original public key and some arbitrary message M, okay? And I'm going to multiply that by the generator of my elliptic curve group. What this multiplication does is it converts this, uh, this hash, which is a number, it converts it into a point, which is like a public key, which allows me to add them together, okay? So the effect of doing this transformation is that before I had a public key that maybe I knew the secret key to, some, some set of people knew the secret key to. Afterwards, I have a different public key, which the same set of people know the secret to, okay? Because I've just, I've just offset it by this value, which is a, a hash of public data. Anybody can compute, I've just offset it. I haven't changed the signing set at all. But what I have done <coughs> is turn the key from just a boring old key into a key that is actually a cryptographic commitment to this message M. 
So if this hash, I'm, I'm just using an arbitrary hash function h, if that hash is a cryptographic commitment, specifically if it's reasonable to model it as a random oracle, then this construction also works as a hash, okay? Uh, you can also model it as a random oracle, and you can sort of see that, that, um, that the, the distribution, as long as I had a, a uniform distribution of hashes, I'm going to get a uniform distribution of points out of this. So, so what, what is the point of this? The point is that if I'm on the blockchain, I'm publishing a key, and this key represents some sort of spending conditions, now I can do one better. I not only have a key on the blockchain, I have a commitment to some secret data. What is this good for? Well, this is good for a couple, couple non-blockchain-y things, like time stamping, say. If I have some data, I want to prove that it existed at some point, I can hide it inside of one of my public keys that I was going to put on the blockchain anyway, and then that goes into the Bitcoin blockchain, that, that time stamps it, because now I have a whole bunch of proof of work on it, there's a certain number of blocks that were created after it. Uh, everybody has a good idea of when every Bitcoin block was created, at least you know within a few minutes or a few hours or whatever. Um, and so I have a, a cryptographic anchor for my message M to the blockchain. You can also use this um, to associate extra data to a transaction that the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't care about. So as an example, um, at Blockstream we work on a project called Liquid, which is a side chain. It's a chain where you can move coins from the Bitcoin chain onto this other chain, Liquid. And the mechanism of doing that is that all the coins that are on the alternate chain, from Bitcoin's perspective, these are actually in the custody of this 11 of 15 quorum of, of who we call functionaries. And so to move coins onto the chain, you send them to the functionaries, and then you go onto the, the side chain and you write a special transaction okay. saying, hey, I locked up these coins on Bitcoin, please give them to me on the side chain. Um, and the consensus rules of the side chain know how to look at Bitcoin and, and verify that you did so. But how do you say this is me, right? Because you're sending the coins to the functionaries. They're the same 15 people all the time. How do you identify that, that you were the one who locked up the coins? When from Bitcoin's perspective, you gave them to the same people that everyone else did? You use this construction. You put some identifying thing here in this message M, throw that onto the Bitcoin blockchain. You then reveal M on the sidechain, and the sidechain validators can verify this equation is satisfied. So there's, there's an example use of this. The coolest use, all right, next slide, the coolest use of, of what this is is going to be in Taproot. But first let me quickly um, throw out this, this um, maxim, the Taproot assumption, which is that in most situations, most use of the Bitcoin script, you have this wide range of spending conditions that represent different possibilities for how your parties might interact, but ultimately you have a fixed set of parties that are known up front. In a lightning payment channel, you've got the two participants in the channel. Um, in an escrow type arrangement, you've got the two parties in the escrow. In something like Liquid, you've got the 15 functionaries who are all signing stuff. Uh, on a standard wallet, you've got the one individual party. And if everyone who has an interest in these coins agrees to move the coins, they can just sign for the coins. And as I mentioned two slides ago, they can just sign for the coins using a single key that represents all of their joint interests and do so interactively. So the, um, the taproot assumption here is that in the common case, in the happy case of moving Bitcoin, you only actually need a key and a signature. Okay, there's, there's no need, all this scripting stuff is sort of there as a backstop for when things don't go well or for when you have weird, weird requirements or weird assumptions. So, with that said, we can get into where pay to contract comes in, where this commitment thing comes in. And now here I'm actually going to describe what Taproot is, okay? So, we use MAST to hide our spending conditions in a giant Merkle tree, we get a single hash. We take that hash, we use our key commitment construction to commit to that hash inside of a public key, which you put on the blockchain. And then we say, the public key is how you spend the coins. So what hits the chain is a single key, in the happy case of a single signature, nobody even sees that any additional conditions exist. If you do reveal that, they only see that one of the conditions. But in the typical case, whether you're doing, whether you're a normal wallet with a single key that, that's uh, just on a user's hardware wallet or something, or if you're doing an escrow, or if you're doing a lightning payment channel, or if you're doing a, a liquid transfer, or if you're doing some sort of non-custodial trade, or if you're doing whatever you're doing, what hits the chain is one key, one signature. Okay, and this is cheaper for everyone to validate than putting all their conditions explicitly on there. 
is also much better for privacy because you're not revealing what the conditions are. You aren't even revealing that there were any special conditions. You're not revealing how many participants were involved, how many people have an interest, and what that interest looks like. You're not revealing any of that. That's Taproot, okay? Um, and then there's a, a whole bunch of detailed design stuff that I'm just not going to go into here. But on the high level, that's the idea, okay? So, in the next uh, five minutes, I'm going to, uh, I could go for 10. We'll see, when, when Hugo tells me to stop, I won't, I'll do that sometimes. Um, let me talk about some of the design considerations that specifically went into this, or the kind of ways that we had to think about Taproot, okay? So before I do that, let me quickly talk about Bitcoin development. Um, I know a lot of people here are MIT students, um, or students from other, other universities. Um, and there's a perception, um, a lot of you guys have startups, a lot of, uh, the perception is there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in the cryptocurrency world, right? There's all these new things being developed, there's all these new technologies being deployed. Um, meanwhile, Bitcoin is sort of the, the dinosaur in the room that never really changes and that doesn't have any of the cool stuff. It doesn't have the cool scripting language, it doesn't have all the cool privacy tech, um, it doesn't have the, the DAGs and, the, um, and all this cool stuff. And there's this idea that Bitcoin maybe hasn't really changed, right, in the last several years because we don't have, like, new features and, like, new press releases saying, like, here's a cool thing you can do on Bitcoin that you couldn't do before. On some level, everything you can do in Bitcoin in 2020 was technically possible in 2009, although very, very difficult and very, very inefficient for, for many reasons. And so the reason for this perception <coughs> is that deploying new things on Bitcoin is very slow, okay? If you have a proposal, you need to write it up, you need to have a detailed description of the proposal, you need to have code that's written, you need to have a fair bit of buy-in from the developer community, and that's just to have like a proposal, to have something that somebody's willing to give a BIP number to. And a BIP number means almost nothing. Um, then you need to go through probably years of review. You need to get um, input from various stakeholders in the ecosystem. You need to, to go through all this rigor, uh, rigmarole. And it's just a very long process. And it can feel kind of frustrating because there are a lot of other projects out there where you have a cool idea, you show up on the IRC channel, and they're like, wow, somebody's interested in our stuff. Yeah, like, we'll, we'll deploy your thing, of course. Um, and then you get stuff out there. So you see, like, various projects out there that are having hard forks every six months or something, um, deploying cool new stuff that's, that's very experimental and very bold. That's super exciting. But Bitcoin can't do that. The requirements on Bitcoin are much higher. Um, in particular, um, Bitcoin is by far the most scalable cryptocurrency that's deployed anyway. And it is probably not scalable enough for serious, like, worldwide usage. Okay, so we're really, really hesitant to do anything that's going to slow down uh, validation, or even to do anything that doesn't speed up validation. That's maybe the most pressing concern. Um, others would argue that privacy is the most pressing concern. That's also a very valid viewpoint. Unfortunately, improving privacy often comes with very difficult trade-offs that, that Bitcoin's unable to make in terms of weird new crypto assumptions or... Uh, or speed, or size, okay? Um, but despite the difficulty in deploying things, the pace of research in Bitcoin is incredibly fast. So over the last two years, so I kind of hinted at all of these things that we can do with keys and signatures. Over the last two years, we've seen just like this explosion of different cool things that you can do just with keys and signatures. And there's kind of an irony here, right? It's so slow to deploy stuff on Bitcoin, we're like, well, what do we have? We have keys, what can we do with keys, right? Um, but we've actually done a tremendous amount with keys, far more than I think anybody, uh, even in the academic cryptography space, we said, like, like let, let's do cryptography, but you're, the constraint is you're only allowed to output a key and a signature at the end. First of all, they say, like, what? Like, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Um, and I actually did a talk at NIST once with this upshot, and I got, like, belly laughs from people. They like, thought it was hilarious that there was this community of Bitcoin people uh, who had, like, tied all their hands behind their back in such a dramatic way. Um, but a result of all this is that there is a, a tremendous amount of research that's de developing really cool stuff, really innovative things that wind up having better scalability and better privacy than those things would had we been deploying it in, in the standard way where we're allowed to have new crypto assumptions, where we're allowed to use as much space as we want, where we're allowed to spend quite a bit of time verifying stuff. Okay? Then, as I mentioned, and I'm going to kind of rush through these two slides, um, 
there's a lot of difficulty, even if you have a proposal that checks all these boxes, then you've got to get through a whole bunch of hoops, right? This change has to be accepted by the entire community, which includes very many people, including miners, the protocol developers, the wallet developers, who often have like opposing goals, HSM developers who are in their own little world where they have no memory and, and no space and no state, and they want the, their, the protocol yep, to be able so to I reset. So I got up this morning and got some coffee and, and uh, <laughs> some slides. Hold on. Yep. Okay. Um, we have retail users uh, who just want their stuff to work and who often want bad things to not happen, even when the cryptography guarantees that bad things will happen to them. Um, we have institutional users who care even more about bad things not happening, uh, exchanges, custodians, blah, 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 blah. And all of these people have some interest in the system. And all of these categories represent people who have a large economic stake in the system. And if any change makes their lives meaningfully worse, without giving them tremendous benefit, they are going to complain, and you are not going to get your proposal anywhere. You're going to have endless fights on the development mailing list, okay? And by the way, just proposing an upgrade at all is making people's lives worse, because now they have to read stuff, so you're going to have fights about that. So, um, Bitcoin, I checked this morning, um, has a market cap of about $170 billion. Uh, this is not flash in the pan money. It's been over $100 billion for several years now. Um, and when we deploy changes to Bitcoin on a worldwide consensus system, these changes can't be undone. If we screw up the soundness and, the, and then it forks into a million different, different things and then there's no more agreement on the state of the chain, probably that's just game over, okay? Um, if people lose their money, if, if like coins can get stolen or something, it's just game over. Um, and it may even be game over for the whole cryptocurrency space because that would be such a tremendous loss of faith in this technology which remember is in the eyes of the wider public, as slow as Bitcoin is to us, it is really fast and reckless and crazy and all this crazy cypherpunk stuff uh, going into a computer system that has nobody in charge of it that is supposed to just guarantee everybody's life savings. Right, it's nuts, it's nuts. And if we screw it up, we screw it up. Game over. We all uh, find new jobs, I guess. Um, maybe go on a speaking circuit saying, <laughs> apologizing. Um, <laughs> So there we go. So that, that's the, the heaviness of, of protocol changes. Um, I'll say a couple of quick words about cryptography. In the first half of the talk, I, I was talking about all these cool things you can do with just keys, just signatures. Isn't this great? No additional resources on the chain, right? So that's not, not quite true, but we're, um, you would think that adding these new features would involve some increase of resources, at least for some users. But in fact, we've been able to keep this to like a couple bytes here and there, or in certain really specific scenarios when somebody has to reveal more hashes than they otherwise would. And we've been kind of spoiled with the magic of cryptography over the last several years that we've been able just by grinding on, on research, we've been able to find all these cool new scalability and privacy improvements that have basically no trade-offs other than deployment complexity and so forth. Cryptography can't do everything, we think. It's hard, I mean, so there aren't really any hard limits on what cryptography can do that necessarily prevent us from just doing everything in an arbitrarily small amount of space. But it's an ongoing research project. Every new thing is something new that takes many years of, of research to come up with. Okay, and when we're making deployments, I said if we make anyone's lives worse, then it's not gonna go through. This includes wasting like a couple bytes. So for example, on Taproot, the one, one technical thing that I'm gonna go back into is we had public keys that took 33 bytes to represent. That's 32 bytes plus one extra bit, uh, which represents uh, basically a choice of two different points that have the same X coordinate. Um, we found a way to drop that extra bit. We had to bit add a bit of complexity. There was an argument about how we wanted to drop that extra bit or what the meaning of the bit would have been. Would it be the evenness or oddness of the point of the number we alighted? Would it be whether it's a quadratic residue? Would it be how, like what part of the range of possible values it lives in? Like stuff, stuff like this. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we spent quite a while grinding on, even though it's not very exciting, and uh, it's certainly not like some like cool new like flash loan technology or whatever that, that various other projects are deploying. But this is stuff that's important for getting something through on a worldwide system where everybody's a stakeholder and nobody wants to spend money on extra bytes. Okay, and then finally, I'm going to say just a quick gener few general wor words about politics. I deliberately ran out of time here so I wouldn't have to linger on the slide. Um, and I said most of this, 
right? Usually when we think about Bitcoin politics, those of us who have been around for a little while think of like the SegWit debacle where we had like this, this UASF thing going on and we had miners doing secret ASIC boost and we had like misalignment of incentives between users and developers and miners. And there was like this fork, there was like this Bitcoin cash thing and there was all this grandstanding, like people saying, oh, we're going to create a fork such that we'll have no replay connect um, protection so that if you don't give us what we want, we're going to like cause all sorts of money loss and so forth. Um, that was pretty dramatic, but that's not really what Bitcoin politics are like generally. Generally, Bitcoin politics are the things that I've been talking about. You have a whole wide set of participants. They generally are afraid of change. They're afraid of complexity, with very good reason, by the way. We've seen a lot of technology failures on other projects deploying things too rapidly. Um, we have a lot of people who feel that Bitcoin is increasingly onerous to validate that the blockchain is getting too large, that there's already too much of a verification burden, that that's what we need to be doing, is reducing that somehow. We have people who think privacy is the most important thing. Um, again, with, with good reason, Bitcoin's privacy story is absolutely horrible. Um, we have an aversion to reading stuff, as, as some people in this room probably are aware. When you propose things for Bitcoin, it can be hard just to get people to read your emails, especially if you have some cool new crypto and it requires a lot of, of cognitive load for people to read, um, or a lot of cognitive load for people to deploy, it, it can just be difficult to, to compete for people's attention. And then even once you succeed in that, there's a long process. There's going to be a lot of bike shedding on like various trivial features of your proposal that you've got to be polite with and you've got to just try to come to a conclusion. Um, on the opposite end of, end of bike shedding, you're going to get demand for proof. Um, you're going to get, yep, yeah, I'm out of time, but. You're going to get um, demands that you really prove your idea and that you deploy it in a very solid way, and that can take quite a bit of time and energy. Um, yeah, and I think that's all that I have time to say. So thank you all for coming. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have time for questions? <laughs> we, we have time for one question. That was great, thanks. Uh, just to make sure I understand, this is general, not specific to Bitcoin at all. Any blockchain, distributed ledger, uh, Grin, uh, Algorand, uh, Bitcoin, it would work for all of them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, although in Bitcoin, there's a much more extreme um, aversion to experimental technology. Like all the blockchains you mentioned kind of were deployed around some new technology that they wanted to prove, right? So kind of by nature, these are more willing to accept new ideas. Um, or ideas that maybe have different trade-offs in terms of algorithmic complexity or cryptographic assumptions or something like that. Um, but you're right, like in any blockchain that expects to survive and that expects to continue to work for its users, all these considerations apply. Thank Definitely. you. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I walked in a little, oh, sorry. I walked in a little late, but um, just give me a reference so I can read about Taproot. Uh, oh, I forgot to put the links here. So, Peter, BIP 340? 341. 341. So if you Google BIP 341, that will give a full description of the Taproot protocol, including motivation and design rationale and like a, an introduction. It has links to source code. Um, I think that would be the best, the best place to start. 